So today we are going to talk about two features of 5G. Uh, one of the first one we are going to talk about is carrier aggregation. And after that, we'll move to the second uh, topic, which is dual connectivity. And both are kind of uh, related, but they are also different in unique ways. Now, before I begin, uh, you know, talking about these two features, uh, although the title of the talk is titled 5G Carrier Aggregation and Dual Connectivity, these two features are not particular to 5G. In fact, they were there in earlier technologies as well. Both of them are available in LT, and uh, at least one of them is available. Uh, e even Wi-Fi uh, has uh, a bit of both. And not only that, uh, even earlier technologies like 3G has carrier aggregation uh, built into it. So these two features are not new to 5G. So our discussion today will cover, you know, a historical perspective as well how we got to these features in 5G, what they are in 5G. But we will also look at how it has evolved from uh, 3G to LTE to 5G. So that comparison will also be uh, useful. But having said that, because we have very short amount of time, like one hour, we will not be able to cover the whole uh, breadth and depth of these two features. But we'll start with a high level introduction to these features and then we'll get into the details. The complexity is really in the details. So let's begin with the carrier aggregation. So the, as you can see in this image, the concept is very simple. Uh, here the example is uh, we are looking at LTE as an example and uh, we are looking only at downlink, but carrier aggregation applies for uplink as well. So let's take downlink as an example. An LTE channel has a bandwidth of 20 megahertz. That is a typical LTE channel. Uh, that is the maximum bandwidth, but you can have uh, channels with a lower bandwidth uh, as low as 1.4 uh, megahertz. But uh, let's uh, talk about the maximum bandwidth that a LTE channel can have. That is 20 megahertz. Unfortunately, the amount of uh, data rate you can push through a single channel is limited because as you know, now people are consuming data more and more and uh, high definition videos are becoming increasingly common on mobile networks. Uh, so given that context, uh, 20 megahertz is almost nothing nowadays. You will not get a good user experience with 20 megahertz, which means that there is already a need for us to move to a higher uh, channel bandwidth per user, per UE. But you can't get it with a plain LTE. So that is where the idea of carrier aggregation came about. So instead of changing the you know, uh, technical parameters too much at the physical layer, Mac layer and so on, the idea was take an existing LTE radio channel and combine it with other channels. So this is basically the basic idea of carrier aggregation. You take an existing channel, combine it with other channels in the same technology. So in this particular example, you take a 20 megahertz channel, combine it with four other 20 megahertz channels. So you get five times 20 megahertz and you get up to 100 megahertz of bandwidth. So what do we gain by uh, carrier aggregation? The main thing that we gain is higher peak data rate because that is what uh, users are looking for. Lower latency because some applications require lower latencies. And this in turn translates to better, better user experience for, uh, for those UEs which have this capability of carrier aggregation. Apart from these two main things, there are other network side effects. For example, uh, because you are using the channels in a more uh, efficient manner, network efficiency and capacity improves and you use the spectrum resources more uh, efficiently. So those are extra, you know, uh, kind of secondary advantages or benefits of carrier aggregation. But the main reason why it was introduced is really for this purpose, to improve the throughput and give users a better experience. So with this introduction, let's get down to the next one. Next level of detail. So as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, carrier aggregation is not specific to 5G. It was already available in uh, 3G. Uh, in fact, it was available in HSPA. 
then it got introduced in LTE advanced, then it has come into uh, 5G networks. Okay. Apart from that, Wi-Fi also has carrier aggregation, but it is uh, done slightly differently in Wi-Fi, and the terminology is also different in Wi-Fi. So we'll not talk too much about uh, carrier aggregation of Wi-Fi in today's talk. But if you look at uh, specifics for LTE advanced and 5G, this is what we have. In LTE advanced, we can have up to five carriers which can be aggregated. So as we saw in the earlier example, five times 20 megahertz, that is the maximum you can have. You can have up to 100 megahertz of aggregated bandwidth. But in release 16 of LTE, so which is called LTE advanced pro, you can have up to 32 carriers which are aggregated. And this can give you a maximum bandwidth of 640 megahertz. So you can see carrier aggregation has really uh, become an important feature in LTE because from what was 20 megahertz, we have gone all the way up to 640 megahertz. This is one of the very important features of LTE. Uh, I mean, uh, I, those who are working in LTE will know this because LTE has already had a very long lifespan and it is going to continue because LTE networks are not going to be immediately replaced with uh, 5G networks. So for quite some time, we will see both LTE and 5G coexisting. And when that is the case, we have to get the maximum out of LTE networks. So that is where release 16 comes in. So you can aggregate up to 32 carriers, getting a maximum bandwidth of 640 megahertz with LTE alone, which is quite amazing. Then we come to 5G. So 5G also supports carrier aggregation. So as you know, 5G has two uh, frequency ranges, FR1, which is uh, mid band, and then we have FR2, which is the millimeter wave band, what we also call as the high band. So you can now aggregate up to 16 carriers in 5G, right? And uh, uh, you can have a maximum aggregated bandwidth of 1 gigahertz, which is obviously more than what LTE can offer. So although the number of carriers is now less here, but the capability of 5G itself is more. So you can imagine the maximum bandwidth per channel in LTE is 20 megahertz. But in 5G, the maximum bandwidth per channel in FR1 is already 100 megahertz. Whereas a channel in FR2 has 400 megahertz. So each channel already offers quite a lot of bandwidth in 5G. Plus you aggregate 16 carriers, you can achieve a very big aggregated bandwidth. However, by standard, the maximum aggregated bandwidth is limited to 1 gigahertz. Another interesting thing is both in LTE as well as in 5G, each aggregated carrier can use a different numerology. So as you know, those who are already familiar with 5G, numerology simply means that, you know, the subcarrier spacing in OFDM, that can change from one numerology to another, the subcarrier spacing changes. And as a result, you know, the subframe size changes and uh, the bandwidth also changes. So what I'm trying to say here is that carrier aggregation in 5G is quite flexible because each aggregated carrier can use a different numerology. And likewise in LTE also, when you do carrier aggregation, it is not required that all the 32 carriers should have the same bandwidth. It's not required that each of those carriers should have 10 megahertz bandwidth. No, each carrier can use a different bandwidth. Okay, so this is the overall introduction of a carrier bandwidth, uh, carrier uh, aggregation. Let's get into what are the different types of uh, carrier aggregation. So at a high level, these are the two broad types. One is called intraband and the other is called interband. So you take for example, so uh, both these are easy to understand just by the picture itself. You can understand in this case, we are showing only two bands and in each band we are using one carrier. So this is the interband. So for example, this could be 1800 megahertz. This could be, uh, for example, 800 megahertz, right? So they are, they are completely two different bands. Whereas in intraband, you have, uh, let's say this is 1800 megahertz band. And within that, you have two component carriers. 
So you are aggregating two carriers within the same band. So this is called intra band aggregation. This is also intra band aggregation, except that these two carriers are not contiguous. That means that they are not adjacent to each other. There are other bands in between. Now this is very important. You know, you may actually this is the easiest to implement for uh, engineers uh, uh, designing mobiles or even the network side components. This is the easiest to implement because th the two carriers are next next to each other. When these two are not next to each other, then the design becomes a little bit more complex from the implement engineering perspective. But from the operator's perspective, this is very important. Both intra band non contiguous as well as inter band. These are very useful for an operator. Why is it the case? Because very often the operator may not have. Carriers which are contiguous. He might have have he might have a license for this carrier and a carrier somewhere else. Or he might have a license in uh, you know 850 megahertz one carrier and 1800 megahertz another carrier. So it is very difficult for an operator to have uh, contiguous carriers uh, in a particular band. So that is where these two uh, configurations come into play. These are very useful now for an operator because they can combine carriers even though they are not adjacent to each other. Okay, so these are the different types of carrier aggregation. Let's look at a little bit of history because uh, as I said, history is very useful. Like I said in the beginning, uh, carrier aggregation did not start with 5G. It was already introduced in 3G. So not the plain 3G, which came out in say roughly 2000 or 1999 with release 99. But you know we had other releases like release six and release seven, which in introduced new features in 3G called HSDPA and HSUPA, so high speed downlink packet access. And in uh, uplink, you had high speed uplink packet access. So these two like enhancements or evolution of 3G came about. But they, up to 2008, that is to say release seven, there was no carrier aggregation in 3G. So carrier aggregation was first introduced in 2009 with release 8. So in HSDPA it was introduced first, that is to say in the downlink where you could aggregate two carriers. So each carrier being 5 megahertz and you could good get a cumulative uh, or aggregated bandwidth of 10 megahertz. So this is how carrier aggregation started in cellular. So you can if somebody asks you when did carrier aggregation start? In uh, cellular systems, you can say it is 2009. It started with HSDPA. So subsequently, in release nine, it got introduced into HSUPA. And uh, in HSDPA, now there is a subtle change. Do you notice here the two carriers are adjacent to each other, contiguous. Here they need not be contiguous. So now operators have more room to play with carrier aggregation, right? So that came about in release nine. Then in release 10, this two carriers became four carriers. Now you could get a bandwidth of 20 megahertz. And then that became eight carriers in uh, release 11. So by 2012, we got uh, up to uh, say eight carriers. So this is how you know uh, hit, uh, carrier aggregation evolved within 3G. And similar kind of evolution you can see in other technologies as well. So in LTE, for example, it started in 2011 with release 10. So that is when carrier aggregation was introduced, but uh, at that time it was limited to few carriers. And then later on in release 11, they started supporting intra brand non contiguous carrier aggregation. And then much a little later, they uh, expanded this to uh, what do you call as uh, yeah, uh, interband carrier aggregation. One of the interesting things is uh, uh, I already mentioned to you earlier, LTE Advanced Pro supports up to 32 carriers. But even if you take the lower case of five carriers, each having 20 megahertz, you can achieve gigabit LTE. That means LTE alone can supply one Gbps throughput for a UE, which is quite amazing. So how is this possible? Because along with carrier aggregation, there are a lot of other enhancements which came to LTE advanced. 
for example, 256 form, 4 by 4 MIMO. So all these things together, uh, you know, brought the LTE network uh, quite on par with uh, 5G or at least the initial 5G deployments. So which is why I say that LTE networks are going to be important at least for the next five years and they are not going to go away quickly because and carrier aggregation has an important role to play in LTE networks. Another interesting thing to note is that uh, this is uh, true for both 5G as well as in LTE. When we do carrier aggregation, there is no constraint that both the carriers should be using FTD or both the carriers should be using TDD. So as you can see here, this is an example from LTE carrier aggregation where we are doing carrier aggregation across bands. So obviously it is interband, but at the same time, the two bands are using different duplexing technologies. So band 19 is using FDD. So uplink is on one frequency, downlink on another. And band 42 is using TDD. So they are sharing the same uh, carrier band, but they are using they are multiplexed in time. OK, so the duplexed in time. So this is important to understand. There is no restriction that, you know, carrier aggregation can be done only uh, if the duplexing, duplexing is the same across all the different bands. That is not the case. OK, so this kind of feature where you can integrate both the FDD and TDD as part of carrier aggregation, this came in release 12 of LTE advanced, so which is uh, around 2015. So LTE has been going a constant upgrade right from 2011 when release 10 came out, when the first carrier aggregation was introduced to into LTE, then 2015 when this kind of a feature was introduced and so on. Uh, and I think a little later, probably, yeah, around this time only, the inter-band inter carrier aggregation was also, also introduced. So now look at, uh, let's look at this interesting chart here, which I wanted to share. This is looking at carrier aggregation in LTE networks. So I was actually looking for a similar chart for 5G networks, but I could not find because the carrier aggregation in 5G, it is common, but uh, no one has published this kind of a chart. So let's work with the LTE networks. If you look at the LTE networks, you can see that, you know, these are the top two combinations of carrier aggregation. And you can see in both these cases, two carriers have been aggregated, right? Now you might, ask you know you know we spoke about uh, two band combination rather so you have a, a band here which is uh, b3 b7 and then this is b3 uh, b20 so two band combinations are most common in uh, lte networks then the third most popular one is a three band combination 3a 7a and 20a uh, so you might be wondering what are these numbers uh, how does it translate to actual bands so you can see here 3A, 7A, which is actually the most common combination in LTE. That is nothing more than 1800 megahertz and 2600 megahertz. OK, so these two bands have been combined. And the next most uh, popular combination is uh, 1800 megahertz and 800 megahertz. OK, so this is also a popular combination. Now, if you look at the most popular three band combination, it is basically a combination of these two, 3A, 7A and 20A, meaning that 1800, 2600, 100 and 800 megahertz have been combined to get an aggregated bandwidth of 60 megahertz. That means to say in each of these bands, we are using only one carrier. Okay. Now, we spoke so much about LTE that, you know, LTE supports like up to 32 uh, carriers which can be aggregated, but that is theoretically. In practice, you can see that most networks are using only two or three. Right. So that in reality, you know, you will not in real networks, you will not see so many uh, band combinations. Of course, this is only showing the top 10 combinations, but there may be uh, there are, of course, other combinations uh, of three bands, four bands as well but very few networks would have actually deployed them. Now let's look at some real uh, numbers. 
so in may 2022 that is just few months back about maybe 6 months back nokia along with an operator demonstrated the carrier aggregation in a 5g standalone network so so far we have been talking about carrier aggregation in lt but of course 5g also has carrier aggregation and in 5g as i told you before you can aggregate in fr1 fr2 or in combination of both fr1 and fr2 so in in this particular demo what has nokia done so what they have done is they have combined uh, bands 2100 in ftd 2300 in tdd and 3500 in tdd right so all these are bands which are available for a 5g uh, system so they have aggregated three bands and uh, they also state that uh, customers who are using a samsung s22 phone they will soon be able to use this uh, i mean uh, get this carrier aggregation and equivalently the data rates commercially so this was of course a demo uh, or a controlled kind of a test but soon they at the same time they st- said that this will become commercially available in the network so i optus i believe is a australian operator then in august uh, nokia and bt networks in the uk they demonstrated four uh, carriers which could be aggregated again in 5g standalone network so what do i mean by standalone uh, it means that here we are not using an lte network all carriers belong to a 5g network so in this case in a four uh, carrier ag- aggregation situation the bands that have been used in this particular uh, say demo is 2.1 2.6 3.4 3.6 okay so these four carriers have been aggregated now notice that in the in these particular examples uh, you know uh, there is no fr2 which has been involved but fr2 was also used uh, in other cases so when we go and look at dual connectivity we will see uh, mention uh, so i will mention more examples of involving fr2 okay so this is a high level view of carrier aggregation any questions at this point next i will move to dual connectivity but before that i want to give people a chance to ask questions on carrier aggregation yeah good evening arvind i i have a question can sure. uh, the ue point of view if we if you say that more number of carriers we can aggregate these carriers are in a different frequency band right yeah. so in a, in a ue perspective uh, how ue is able to capture different frequencies in the same time domain yeah it's a good question actually it is a very challenging thing so although we say 32 carrier component carriers uh, we don't mean that uh, each component carrier will be in a different band so that will become uh, a very uh, dramatic engineering challenge as you said a ue cannot receive so many different bands so typically what will happen even if you assume you know 32 component carriers are being received by the ue many of them will be intra band so at the most you will have two bands two bands or three bands whatever yeah but usually most ues in the market are capable of only two bands or three bands they will not be capable of more than that in fact most of them will be capable of only two bands i believe but if someone knows better than this yeah they can uh, yeah, chip in no, so no, having no, said that uh, yeah uh, so uh, that is the one thing and uh, the other thing is uh, you can uh, see the, the when when it is intra band and even if the bands are not contiguous the ue will be able to do uh, filter the correct ca- carriers so that capability is there with the ue and within the standard perspective uh, standard has defined different ue classes for carrier aggregation so when uh, manufacturers make these ues they will specify what class a particular ue belongs to Uh, of course when we buy mobiles we don't look into that level of detail right so mainly we look at some high level features and we look at the price but you can be sure that if the price is high you know it has a better uh, carrier aggregation capability and that will also be reflected in the carrier aggregation class of the ue so that class will tell precisely 
whether it supports intra band or inter band or uh, uh, contiguous non contiguous and how many bands can be aggregated all the all those things will be specified as part of the ue class yeah somebody so, had a comment or a question go ahead so the the antenna system in the ue itself is capable of uh, tuning to multiple frequency right yeah yeah. Okay. Thank you. Arvind, in the two examples that uh, uh, that you discussed about the 5G from Nokia and other, uh, oh, so do yeah, you also have yeah. the maximal number of throughput that they were able to achieve by? Yeah. Carrying? So I was also looking for that number. They have not uh, in these demos. They have not disclosed what is the throughput achieved. Uh, but theoretically, we could, you know, come out. Uh, you, we could calculate. Uh, it will be uh, more than one Gbps for sure. Oh, okay. Because okay. Uh, you know, four carriers are aggregated. It should be more than one Gbps. But I have another example. When we get to dual connectivity, there are other demos uh, which people have conducted. So there, uh, we'll get uh, meaningful numbers for the data rate. But here, I believe you will achieve more than one Gbps. It will be much more. I believe. Yeah. Arvind, I do have another question on uh, yeah, doing ahead. DA uh, on the different duplexing methodology, the FTD and TDD. Yeah, yeah. Uh, do you see if we are aggregating uh, 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 from the same two carriers from coming out from the same duplexing method uh, and the hybrid duplexing method? Uh, do we see change? There is an advantage of uh, amplifying the throughput in one case, but not that much in another case. Uh, yeah, I don't know the answer for that, but typically that is not the reasoning uh, how people do it. See, operator will look at what licenses he has. So operator oh. will say, oh, OK, I have a license for band 19. I have a license for band 42 and the operator will say, can I aggregate these two? Got it. So that Got is how the operators look at it. Because everything starts with the licenses they hold. And in fact, some of these things came about like that because see when carrier aggregation started, this was not there. Then operators requested, can you build this into the standard? Because I need to aggregate, uh, you know, my license in FDD band 19 and my license in band 42. Then it got introduced into the standard in the next release. So some of these features were actually driven by operators. OK, thank you. Yeah. OK, so now let's move on to dual connectivity. So we got an understanding of what carrier aggregation is. So now the next one. Dual connectivity again, it is simple, uh, similar to carrier aggregation, but there are some key differences and there are also some uh, misunderstandings, I would say, right? And uh, the what do you call the motivation for dual connectivity is also quite different from uh, carrier aggregation. So let's uh, start by understanding what is uh, dual connectivity. So dual connectivity was uh, first introduced in LT in release 12 to allow a UE to be connected to two E node Bs to send and receive packets from both the E node Bs. So the network component in the RAN uh, to which the UE connects is actually E node B. Uh, the equivalent component in a 5G network is G node B. Just for people who are uh, not familiar with these terms, E node B is nothing more than a base station, right? In a LTE or a 4G network, the equivalent base station uh, in 5G system is called a G node B. So now what dual connectivity says, dual connectivity says that the UE must be able to connect at the same time be active, that is sending and receiving packets to two E node Bs. Mind you, we are not talking about, uh, you know, connecting a UE to LTE plus 5G. We are not talking about that. So that is one of the misunderstandings or misrepresentations. But that is one of the important things about dual connectivity, but that is not how it is to be defined. Dual connectivity is when a UE is connected to two uh, network nodes in the radio access network. 
So in the LTE case, U is connected to two E node Bs. In the 5G case, it is connected to two G node Bs. But when you involve both 5G and LTE, then the UE can be connected to one E node B in the LTE network and one G node B in the 5G network. So that is also dual connectivity. In fact, that is one of the most important combinations of dual connectivity. So ultimately, this is the definition of dual connectivity. Now in 5G release 15, uh, this concept of dual connectivity uh, was expanded. So you can connect both to like an LTE network as well as a 5G NR node. So that is how dual connectivity uh, became essential uh, for both LTE and the 5G networks. Now in uh, either of these cases, there is no restriction about the core network. Core network can be your EPC, which comes from 4G or it can be a 5G core. So core network can be anything. So now given all these combinations, they all come under the umbrella term of multi-radio dual connectivity. Okay, or MRDC. So remember this, uh, you know, word because this is something you will come across uh, very frequently when you are talking about dual connectivity. So now, uh, you know, this was earlier called as multi-rat dual connectivity. So in fact, some of the older 3GPP documents will still have that kind of a nomenclature. If I have to write it down, I'll write it down here. So MRDC actually stands for multi-radio dual connectivity, but earlier it was known as multi-rat multi, multi dual connectivity. So the reason for, the, <coughs> for that was uh, I mean, I don't know if there is a reason, but anyway, this caused a little bit of misunderstanding among some uh, developers or engineers. Because it was multi-rat, they thought that dual connectivity means that the UE should be connected to LTE network plus a 5G network, because that is what multi-rat means. You should be connected to two different radio access technologies. But later, this acronym was revised to multi-radio dual connectivity, which is more meaningful because dual connectivity applies even if the UE is connected to only LTE network, just that it is connected to two E node Bs, or it is connected only to a uh, 5G network, in which case it is connected to two G node Bs, right? So that is why the acronym was changed from multi-rat dual connectivity to multi-radio dual connectivity. So this is one of the important points I wanted to share. Now, what is the underlying uh, motivation for dual connectivity. So you may say higher throughput, but for higher throughput, we already have carrier aggregation. Sorry, Bappa, I didn't want to say that. Sorry, there is a disturbance. I request you to mute your mics. So uh, in, uh, I was saying in dual connectivity, what is the motivation? So obviously you get uh, more throughput, higher data rate, lower latency, just like carrier aggregation. But when you already have carrier aggregation, why do you need dual connectivity? And the reason for that is dual connectivity has a greater motivation. That is mainly for mobility, stable connections, and uh, better management of handovers. These are the real motivations for dual connectivity. And to, for example, uh, so let's take this particular example, which is a slide from uh, Qualcomm. So this slide shows uh, UE, which is connected both to a LTE uh, E node B and a 5G G node B. Now a 5G, let us assume that 5G is in a higher frequency. Let's say it's in the 3.5 uh, gigahertz uh, band. So it has a lower range, smaller uh, coverage. And the LTE is in a different frequency. Let's say it is in a 2100 megahertz. So obviously it has a bigger coverage, bigger range. So that is why here they say lower band and higher band. Of course, in 5G, you can also use millimeter wave, which is uh, 28 gigahertz. So then obviously the 5G cell will be even smaller. Now the thing is, uh, the problem with a 5G cell, if you cell, the connection can be stable, unstable if the UE is mobile. 
let's say you are driving in a car and you are connected only to a 5G mobile, then there is a good chance that uh, you will lose the connection because there will be frequent handovers because each 5G cell has a smaller range. And because of this frequent handovers, the connection can poten potentially there can be a call drop basically. So how do you overcome this problem? So the way to do it is overlay. You have a macro cell which is offered by the LTE network. Then you have a micro cell or a small cell which is offered by your 5G network. So this L LTE cell is because it's a lower band, it is able to do this. Now a UE is connected to both these bands. It is connected both to LTE as well as to 5G. Now what does the UE gain by this? Now the UE has a much more stable connection because even when let's say you are driving in a car, even if you lose the 5G connection, the LTE connection will continue. So at the most what will happen, there will not be a call drop, but you may have suffer a uh, drop in the throughput. Your data rate may drop, your latency may increase, but you will not lose the connection. And because you don't lose the connection, you don't trigger unnecessary handovers. So connection with the LTE cell will continue and the network will try to establish connection to a new 5G cell while maintaining the connection with the LTE cell without involving any handover. So this is one of the beauties of uh, dual connectivity. So this is one of the reasons why dual connectivity was introduced. Another important reason for dual connectivity is migration from 4G to 5G. Okay, this is again a very important uh, consideration for dual connectivity. And to understand this, we need to understand the different ways in which network deployment can happen. So some of you who have been working on 5G, you would have uh, seen this particular uh, image or a similar image like this. There are five, I mean, different ways in which deployment can happen in a 5G slash 4G network. So among these uh, different options that you see on the screen, you have here option three, option uh, four and option seven. So I want to direct your attention to these three options. So what is unique about these three options, option three, option four and option seven? If you notice in these three options, both LTE and 5G uh, radio access network are involved. You can see here two nodes are there, E node B, G node B, E node B, G node B, E node B, G node B. That means to say a UE is connected both to a E node B as well as a G node B. So this is a classic case of dual connectivity in which two radio access technologies are involved, 4G as well as 5G. Right now, why is this important for migration from a 4G network to a 5G network? The simple fact is operators have already invested a lot of money in deploying their 4G networks. So they are not going to give up their 4G networks quickly. And when they have to install a 5G network, they cannot put money uh, into already they have spent so much on licensing. On top of that, they have to invest a lot of money in uh, rolling out 5G equipment. Then they have to upgrade the core network from EPC to 5G core. So everything is uh, adding uh, up cost into their uh, into their operations. So how to solve this problem? The solution is do a slow uh, migration from 4G to 5G. So in that perspective, option three is one of the most attractive options for operators migrating from an existing 4G to a 5G network. What happens in option three? Already you have EPC, already you have your E node Bs which are deployed uh, in the network. All you have to do is deploy a G node B. That is to say a 5G base station. You deploy it in your network. You don't even bother to connect the 5G to the EPC. Even this connection is not required. You just connect the 5G node to your E node B through a non-ideal backhaul link. So when I say non-ideal backhaul link, what I mean is that this link doesn't have low latency. It may have a higher latency, slightly lower throughput compared to an ideal backhaul, which is what you see here. So this would be an ideal backhaul. This would be a non-ideal backhaul. So now when you are first deploying uh, 5G into a 4G network, all you have to deploy is the G node base and connect those G node base to the E node base. 
Now a UV is connected both to E node B and G node B, but the traffic coming to G node B will go through the E node B to the core network. This is the simplest and the most cost effective way for a network operator to deploy 5G into a 4G network. So at a later point, they can then migrate to a 5G network. So what they can do, they can do two things in both these options four and seven. They can migrate the core network. So core network from 4G it becomes 5G core. Same thing here with option seven, it becomes a 5G core. But in the radio access network, you still have E node B's and G node B's. You have not replaced the E node B's. You are still maintaining the 4G base stations. At later time, when you are when the operator is ready and the operator has rolled out enough 5G towers and they are ready to remove 4G nodes, then the, op the whole network migrates to option two. So this is the final uh, you know, step in this journey. So now you have migrated your, your, both your radio access network as well as your core to entirely 5G. Now having come to option two, don't think that there is no carrier and there is no dual connectivity. Remember what is the definition of dual connectivity? Two nodes. So the UV can still connect to two different G node Bs, which means that you will have carrier aggregation purely in within a 5G network. Okay. So with this understanding, let's look at some terminology because this is the terminology you will come across very frequently when you are re reading the literature. So we talked about four combinations, uh, many options. Those options basically translate to, to this. NDC. So in NDC, UE connects to uh, two, two nodes. One of them is the E node B and one of them is the G node B. Let me enlarge this. So in NDC, UE connects to G node B, uh, E node B and G node B. And this one is called as the master node. This is called as the secondary node. That means to say the signaling will mostly go through the master node. This is the most important node. Now let's go back to our old scenario where we had a micro cell or a small cell with this, which is 5G. And on top of that, there was a macro cell, which is LT macro cell. So if you look at it from this, from that context, this E node B is providing you the macro cell. And this G node B is providing you the small cell. This is giving you a stable connection. This is giving you higher throughput. And this particular combination is called the NDC. So most of the LTE, uh, uh, LTE networks, when they become 5G networks, this is the path they, they will be taking because it's the most cost effective path. The other combinations all use 5G core. So you notice this is using EPC. The other combinations they are using 5G core, but the access network is slightly different. So here E node B and G node B and E node B continues to be the master, just like here E node B is the master. In this case, what happened? G node B is the master, right? When you talk about NEDC, that means N is for new radio, E is for EU tra. So the first letter indicates who is the master. So here, uh, NEDC, G node B is the master. So the difference between these two is that here, the 4G node is the master. Here, the 5G node is the master. That is the difference. Then the other last option is the entire network is converted to 5G. There is no E node B here. So the core is 5G, the, you know, the base stations are G node B, but we still have dual connectivity because the UE is connected to two G node Bs. So this is the, these are the four different uh, ways in which uh, uh, multi-radio dual connectivity works. What I have not shown here is the pure LTE case. So you also have a LTE case where both are E node Bs and this one is a EPC. So that is not shown here. Here we are showing only those combinations which involve the 5G network. Okay. So there are other terminologies which I have already explained: master node, secondary node, and then uh, second master cell group and secondary cell group. So this is important to explain. 
uh, we spoke about uh, carrier aggregation previously uh, and now we are talking about dual connectivity but one of the things is uh, these are not mutually exclusive you can have a deployment not only have a deployment i think this is going to be the common way to do deployment the common deployment will be you will have dual connectivity in the network but on top of that for each of the uh, nodes to which the ue is connected you will have carrier aggregation so carrier aggregation you will be used along with the uh, dual connectivity so i have here an uh, uh, an image which uh, points out the differences between uh, carrier aggregation and dual connectivity so as you can see here uh, on the left we have dual connectivity on the right side we have carrier aggregation and uh, you can see here there is a single node base station packets are coming they go through pdcp rlc mac 5 i believe uh, this is an example from uh, yeah this is showing an example of lt that is why it says pdcp straight away but uh, if it's a 5g network you will have another layer called sdap right so there will be one more layer sdap for a 5g network otherwise the rest of the slide is same whether it's 5g or lt so now uh, pdcp doesn't do anything for the case of carrier aggregation because carrier aggregation kicks in at the mac layer so what mac does mac is in charge of uh, so there are two carriers here which is basically uh, carrier is nothing but a frequency so it's a physical layer concept and uh, mac is responsible for uh, dividing the packets that come from rlc so some packets go through one carrier other packets go through another carrier but Uh, given given this understanding uh, yeah you can probably guess uh, what it is there will be a single mac entity within the ue so a single mac entity is sufficient to handle carrier aggregation now if you look at dual connectivity the situation changes quite a lot first the packet is divided pdcp layer pdcp is now responsible for doing the routing so some packets go through one connection and other packets go through the other connection basically two different cells uh, so i will get more into more details in the next uh, slide and uh, in the u from the ue perspective uh, also uh, there will be two separate chains so there will be two entities within the ue mac entities within the ue so the same entity is not responsible for dual connectivity okay so now when you combine these two what happens so you have two entities in the ue each one responsible for talking to one particular uh, uh, node or base station and within each mac entity you handle carrier aggregation so that is how carrier uh, both of them work together carrier aggregation and uh, what you call dual connectivity so there is this interesting quote uh, which has been made in the literature dual connectivity can be seen as carrier aggregation extended to the case of non ideal backhaul okay so you can view carrier and uh, dual connectivity as nothing more than carrier aggregation except that this is important some of the packets in the backhaul they go through a non ideal backhaul link can why is this so important uh, you know Uh, for understanding the uh, dual connectivity so for this let's look at this particular slide so you can see here a ue is connected to a master node let's say it's a g node in e, uh, e node b and it is also connected to a secondary node let's say it's a g node b so this is a classic case of we already saw this case what is this this is called ndc right so this is the ndc or what we call as option 3 so ue is connected both uh, to these but if you notice the uh, uh, control is going through x2 interface right uh, control or even the user plane can go through x2 interface i'm not going in, into greater detail on option 3 there are other enhancements to option 3 but this x2 interface which is connecting the master node to the secondary node 
this is what we call as the non ideal backhaul that means it has a higher latency uh, and uh, lower throughput but still the system is designed to handle this and that is the important difference between dual connectivity and carrier aggregation so that is why you know, you know so with that understanding we will be able to appreciate the statement better so in the case of pure carrier aggregation everything goes through an ideal backhaul which is a direct connection between uh, this is the connection this is the backhaul going from master node to the core network there is no uh, non ideal backhaul involved for carrier aggregation but for dual connectivity packets should go through this non ideal backhaul so that is an important difference to understand so let's go back to this slide uh, so there are some definitions uh, briefly i'll talk about it mcg master cell group that means all the cells which belong to the master node so you may be wondering uh, why am i talking about all the cells uh, isn't there just one cell per node no there could be multiple cells attached to this node and that is what carrier aggregation is all about so when we talk about carrier aggregation we are actually talking about more than one cell if there is only one cell attached to this master node then we can say that there is no carrier aggregation going on here but to be more generic multiple cells can be attached to the master node multiple cells attached to the secondary node and that is why we call this group of cells as the mcg master cell group and the group of cells here as the secondary cell group and the bearers which are carried here are called the mcg bearers these are scg bearers then there is something called split bearer which we briefly covered so in this particular case a packet comes to pdcp pdcp will split the packet not split the packet some packets will go through uh, the 4g network some packets will go through the 5g network right and uh, this split is where uh, the x2 interface comes into play the non ideal backhaul so when a split bearer is involved some packets will go through the x2 interface and that is shown here from a network perspective you can see here as an example an scg bearer comes here some packets go here it goes to rlc in the 5g uh, network 5g node and uh, when no sorry that is not the example i should be talking about this one split bearer so as you can see here in a case of a split bearer the packet comes in here nr pdcp is used then some of the packets pdcp will decide okay some of the packets will go through the 4g network some packets will go through the 5g network so this is the concept of a split bearer whereas in the case of a pure mcg bearer all the packets will go through the master node here scg all the packets will go through the sc node uh, go through the secondary node what is more difficult to understand probably if you are a beginner is the red lines so look at these red lines you have a secondary node here why is a secondary node connected to a scg bearer which is in the master node and the reason for that is in the network these bearers can terminate either way there is no requirement that scg bearer must terminate in the secondary node or in the secondary network there is no restriction that mcg bearer must terminate here mcg bearer can also terminate in the secondary node and that is again where the x2 interface comes in so those packets will again be routed via the x2 interface so let's look at some of the historical notes uh, pertaining to this so how did uh, dual connectivity start so dual connectivity uh, start it's again it's got a long history the study on dual connectivity started in 2013 december as part of the release 12 work for 3gpp and uh, the first dual connectivity came about as i mentioned in lte networks in release 12 of lte advanced so it came about in 2015 so this release introduces intra e ultra dual connectivity so remember at this time there is no 5g in fact 5g itself was not standardized at that time 
So even before that, dual connectivity was introduced first in the LTE networks. Then few months later, Ericsson in partnership with KT, that is I think Korea Telecom, they demonstrate uh, dual connectivity. So in this particular demo, they used two LTE cells, one featuring as a macro cell and another as a small cell. So in our earlier example, we gave the example of uh, macro and a uh, small cell using LTE and 5G. But you can also have macro and small cell with purely LTE cells. And the reason for that is LTE also has different bands. Some bands are uh, low band, which can achieve macro cell. Some are high band, which can achieve uh, higher throughput and small cell and so on. So LTE can also be used uh, for dual connectivity. One interesting thing is LTE can also be combined with uh, Wi-Fi. So for that, there is a standard called uh, or there is a feature called LTE WLAN aggregation. Now, although this is called as aggregation, we should not club this under the umbrella of carrier aggregation. Because here, by definition, two different nodes are involved. One is a LTE node and the other is a Wi-Fi access point. So that is the reason why typically it is, you know, uh, closer to dual connectivity rather than carrier aggregation from 3GPP terminology. So that came about in 2016. 2017, something interesting happened. So December 2017, the first 5G standards were published or ratified. So early drop happened in December 2017. And in this early drop, dual connectivity is already introduced between uh, LTE and the new radio, that is 5G. But in this early drop, standalone scenarios are not supported. What is supported is only non-standalone deployment scenarios, which is option three, option four, option seven. So non-standalone scenarios are supported in this particular December 2017 release. Then a few months later in June 2018, this is the main drop of 5G standards where NRDC started supporting uh, was supported. So this is what we call as the, uh, let's say you can call it pure 5G uh, dual connectivity, where both the nodes are G node Bs and the core is also 5G core. Right? So now 5G becomes, 5G standalone acquires the capability of dual connectivity. Now let's come to May 2020, that is, roughly two years after these features came into the standard. So Nokia claims to achieve a world record speed of 4.7 Gbps on a commercially deployed network in the US. So this is achieved using NDC. What is NDC? It has LTE as an anchor and then a 5G node providing greater throughput. So in this particular dual connectivity scenario, what has happened? They are using 40 megahertz of LTE spectrum and eight times 100 megahertz of millimeter wave spectrum in two different bands, 28 gigahertz and 39 gigahertz. And the RAN is a cloud RAN that was used for this test. Now, by just looking at these numbers and these configurations, immediately you can make out LTE doesn't have 40 megahertz of channel bandwidth. It doesn't have. So when we say 40 megahertz here of LTE spectrum, it immediately implies that what we are doing here is carrier aggregation within LTE. Same thing here. Here it's a bit more explicit. Here it is very obvious, right? We are using 10 megahertz uh, bandwidth and we are aggregating over eight carrier components, component carriers. So this is like the ultimate. You are having dual connect connectivity between LTE and 4, 5G, and within each of those, you have carrier aggregation going on. Okay, so I wanted to point out this uh, interesting demo. One of the early, uh, well, they say commercially deployed. Yes. Now let's come to more recent. Uh, uh, see, this is NDC that is involving both LTE as well as 5G. But eventually what we expect, we expect that all 4G networks will be phased out and everything will become 5G. So in August of 2021, Ericsson and MediaTek, they gave a demo 
of nrtc what is nrtc there is no 4g here both the nodes belong to 5g so using nrtc they achieved a speed of 5.1 gbps so here which are the bands that were used 28 gigahertz millimeter wave 3.7 gigahertz again millimeter wave so here they used 60 megahertz bandwidth here they used 8 times 100 megahertz bandwidth okay so in in this case it is very obvious dual connect uh, carrier aggregation is going on here it is not so obvious whether carrier aggregation has been done or it's uh, just a single carrier okay then in december 2021 ericsson and singtel this is an operator in singapore they achieved 5.4 gbps again with nrdc so here they did it using 3.5 gigahertz and 28 gigahertz so two bands were used so what where, where are we going with this so this sort of multi gigabit speeds see remember lte managed to achieve gigabit speeds by doing a bunch of things carrier aggregation and uh, mimo and uh, you know 256 qom and so on so by using those features lte was able to achieve gigabit speeds 1 gbps and above 5g is easily able to achieve 5 multi giga uh, gigabit speeds so that is where we are going so and this sort of speeds can enable high performance low latency applications including immersive gaming ar vr autonomous vehicles robotic control and so on now before we conclude just a caveat these are all theoretical speeds although they say you know they have demonstrated we have to question is it maybe this has been done in very ideal conditions in a real network if you get 1 gbps on a 5g network that is really great yeah consistently that is to say not intermittently consistently if you are able to get 1 gbps on a 5g network that would be awesome okay uh, there are lot more details in this uh, document uh, you can read it up later on and i have also listed all the different documents that you can refer if you want to know more about these two features so now we uh, break off for questions anyone okay, yeah jana go ahead Okay, if not, yeah, someone else. Yeah, yeah Arvind, yeah. I have a question that so uh, yeah. so what exactly the difference between the E node B and NG node B? You had uh, explained that E and DC and NG E and engine DC, right? Yeah, so, basic difference is E node B is a 4G base station. G node B is a 5G base station. Yeah, no, 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 no not yeah. G node B. You had mentioned that NG E node B. NG okay, iPhone it's so yeah let's go back to the slide this one right yes so in the second diagram you had yeah. mentioned it as a NG E node B what exactly the difference we comes from to the E node B and NG E node B E node B and NG okay see E node B connects to a EPC NG E node B connects to the 5G core so okay. the interface is different okay do you mean that so here uh, the ng interface comes into the picture in the ng node b come again which interface so usually the e node b wants to connect it to the epc s1 interface will comes into the picture yeah, yeah, here yeah so here you mean it that is not, it is connecting to the 5g core so the yeah. ng interface comes into play okay Uh, and one more question on top of which so uh, can we expect uh, so this 5gc the th third diagram you are showing it right so will it will it going to happen this one yeah the third yeah, one, third a, diagram third third diagram this one this one yeah uh, this is uh, yeah it is looks like a unlikely scenario so yeah. Uh, yeah what it is is uh, it's a good question uh, i mean this is my uh, i don't have uh, contact with the operators or anything like that but from my reading of the specs i feel it is unlikely okay 
Okay. The reason is uh, just to make it clear for others who don't know the context of this question. So core has been migrated to 5G core. Oh. Right. And uh, your G node B has become the master node. Yeah. But you are still having uh, 4G base stations in your uh, network. Yeah, it is possible. So the only reason why an operator would do this is they don't. They have already invested a lot of money in their 4G base stations. So they don't okay. want to replace it with a move to a 5G base station. That is the only reason I can think of. Okay. Okay. Fine. For coverage also they can do this, right? Uh, come again? Yeah. To, to maintain the coverage, let's say in a high mobility environment, G node B may not be able to sustain the connection. So NG node B can help. Yeah, so that is where that is a good point, but that not that point is not exactly valid in the long run. And I will tell you why it is not valid. Because even in this case where you have only 5G nodes, you will get the coverage. The reason for this is there is another feature called dynamic spectrum sharing. So what dynamic spectrum sharing does is that let's say an operator already has 4G spectrum. He has got the licenses for 4G. Dynamic spectrum sharing means that the same spectrum can be used for 5G. That means you will get the same coverage. You are using the same band, but instead of using it for 4G, now you have started using it for 5G. And this is possible because 5G standard was designed in such a way taking this into account. Whereas in older standards, let's say between 3G and 4G, the spectrums are not compatible. So you had to do something called reforming. You might have heard this term. Basically what reforming is, is that you have to tell all your customers, I'm going to shut down my 2G network and whatever 2G spectrum I had, I'm going to now start using it for 3G or 4G. So that is called uh, reforming. So, re so when you do that, so that is a different strategy altogether. Whereas in the dynamic spectrum sharing, by design, it allows you to use 4G spectrum for 5G. Of course, again, there will be cer certain restrictions. Maybe there are some spectrum in some bands in 4G which cannot be used in 5G. There may be some restrictions. Yeah, but generally dynamic spectrum sharing is one reason people will not stick to this configuration. So if they can uh, upgrade their E node B to G node B, they will do it. Just to add yeah, on, one, like this one more point uh, I would. Yeah, go ahead. Somebody has, has a point. Yeah, go yeah, ahead. They're interesting here. Uh, the current the configuration which is being highlighted, it is going to be implemented in uh, Geo network because yeah, uh, yeah this is uh, because they are going with SA, but they yeah. already have uh, ENB in the network 4G. So this yeah. is going to be likely used configuration in geo networks. Which one? This one? Yeah, this one. Yeah. Yes. Thanks yeah, for one, sharing that. Yeah. One more point I would like to add is the operator point of view. All the UE will not be changed into a 5G UE in the recent future because there are users who have the traditional 4G handset. So maintaining this uh, architecture will be there in future also. Considering the 4G handset point of view. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And uh, one more query, uh, uh, Aravind, uh, considering the uh, protocol architecture, you have see, uh, shown the protocol stack PDCP and RLC layer. I think yeah. the picture uh, shown in that diagram is related to the E node B side because uh, MCG and SCG split barrier is happening at the E node B side, not the UE side. Right. Yes, let me open that. Split barrier is UE. See, both are given. No? User one. plane, network perspective is given. This is UE perspective. Both are there. Okay, both are there. Yeah, this is user plane. This is control plane. No, no, no. I am not talking about this one. Uh, there is another picture there, uh, pre previous to this one. Which one? Yeah, yeah, that one. This one? That okay, okay. Uh. One. This one is actually in the E node B side, right? Yeah, yeah, E node B. Yeah. 
uh, while you it are is e not b because you see arrows are going towards the dual the mobile so we yeah, are yeah. not showing what is happening inside the mobile so we are okay. showing from network perspective okay you just mentioned it's in the ue side while when you are uh, talking ah okay okay yeah. but ue see what i meant was well, the ue in side the UE. some in the ue side something uh, parallel happens in the sense that for carrier aggregation in the ue there is only one mac entity okay right and the packets are uh, aggregated at mac layer whereas uh, again in the ue side for dual connectivity there will be two mac entities okay. and the aggregation will happen at pdcp yeah right right here with for dual connectivity to be functional uh, both the uh, base stations or, or or the base stations need to have the same served by the same packet core right same packet core yeah that is correct i mean that is given because everything goes to the same core okay yeah. and uh, whether it's a carrier aggregation or the dual connectivity uh, even though these are the radio features uh, but the orchestration in the sense uh, the entity in the network that realizes that hey there is a need for dual connectivity or carrier aggregations those things are orchestrated from uh, packet core or from the radio okay that uh, i don't have the answer i don't have that in depth knowledge so maybe somebody uh, who, who maybe somebody else in the call if you have the answer you can chip in i think it involves the both both coordination mm -hmm. between the radio as well as the core then only it will happen i'm not yeah. sure my understanding is like that okay see the thing is the reason uh, i can't answer is that because these kind of things are not specified in the standard so operator has the choice how they want to implement it. so let's say ue wants uh, 1 gpps throughput because that is how the qs is configured so the network operator can implement however the way they want depending on the current status of resources in their radio network so it is really the kind of this is where the algorithms kick in this is what uh, differentiates uh, one operator's network from another so this is not something the standard will specify standard will not say under these conditions do set up a carrier aggregation channels under these conditions set up dual connectivity standard will not say that so this is where operators can differentiate got it got it thanks 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 arvind yeah uh, i just to add on this i believe uh, uh, in the modern i mean the ngc on the uh, uh, on the radio side uh, there are some tdd mode uh, specification uh, configurations possible so those tdd modes are like you can associate with some uh, apn or dnn in, in 5g so uh, when you define the dnn you can actually associate those tdd modes which can uh, which can define your uh, kind of what kind of downlink or the uplink you require for that particular uh, dnn so accordingly you can uh, probably define uh, what kind of uh, i mean uh, do you require uh, how, how many component carriers needs to be associated with that particular uh, uh qos or the dns and then accordingly you can uh, uh, so basically uh, it will be a core uh, functionality to decide because of course you define the dnn on the core right so so basically it will be driven by by the core and uh, it will kind of accumulate the resources uh, accordingly Uh, uh, based on the uh, TDD modes selected, so basically TDD mode associated with the uh, number of component carriers, and then accordingly you define the uh, QoS. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Uh, one more thing, uh, uh, Arvind, I want, just want to understand uh, globally uh, how many uh, component carriers have been tested. Like, what, what is the maximum uh, component carriers tested for carrier aggregation? Well, the standard allows for 16 uh, for 5G. That is NR. Uh, okay, you are talking about component carriers. Uh, yeah, I don't know globally how many are tested, but 
but uh, yeah most of the information that you find online today they are more on lte networks that is what i found there is still not that much information coming out on uh, how uh, carrier aggregation and dual connectivity are deployed on 5g networks yeah so uh, we have been talking to uh, this uh, i mean the global uh, globally the three big names and they don't promise beyond three as, as of now as on date yeah so they haven't yet touched beyond 3 yeah yeah, yeah. when you say 3 are you talking about uh, carrier aggregation or uh, dual connectivity yeah carrier aggregation carrier, carrier aggregation. aggregation yeah yeah this is uh, actually uh, a practical scenario because most of the network they have licenses for either two or three bands currently that is why practically they could do they could go up to three carrier aggregation this is uh, uh, because of the license and limitations they have most of the networks, developed networks, they have either three or four carriers in 5G right now. Yeah, yeah. So you can see okay. here so is this it, chart. Yeah. Uh, this is an up-to-date chart. The most common combinations are only two, right? Only using two bands. Then this one is using three bands. All others are two bands. This one is three bands. So the, the in the top 10 combinations, we never see a case of uh, a network using four bands. Right. So this is, uh, I mean, the constraint is more due to the uh, regulatory uh, obligations or is it like, or is it a, some kind of a technology? Uh, it's, well, it's a bit of both. As somebody pointed out, uh, operators may not have licenses for so many bands. Right. So that is one aspect of it, uh, but that is not going to prevent UE manufacturers from making phones because if they make a phone with four bands, they will charge a premium. So they right. don't care whether the feature is going to be used or not. Sometimes they will do it just for the heck of it. But having said that, uh, there is a practical challenge which I have mentioned here. I mean, the engineering is not trivial. So there is something called self-interference. Uh, so I have mentioned this for a dual connectivity, but this is also a problem for interband carrier aggregation, where you are aggregating between two bands. So what happens in these cases is that uh, the see UE is transmitting on two carriers, and the, what will happen is uh, these two carriers will have intermodulation products, and these products may fall within the receiver bandwidth. See UE is also receiving on a certain bandwidth. So intermodulation products will fall into the receiver bandwidth. So this will affect the receiver sensitivity. So this is a big engineering challenge. And uh, the standard actually says there are some bands where this problem is quite bad. So preferably you should not use, I mean, it is allowed. You can do carrier aggregation on those bands, but you will not get the best performance or you have to use more costly hardware to get that kind of a performance, which you know you expect on a 5G network. So there are trade-offs here. If you want, there are some band combinations, maybe the operator is unlucky, he is uh, stuck with some combinations. And in those combinations, when they try to do inter-band carrier aggregation or dual connectivity, they see a lot of the self-interference. Only way to solve that is to use more expensive components to solve that. The other way is there is a feature called single TX dual connectivity, which has been introduced in a more recent release of uh, 5G. So what single TX does is because of this interference challenge, you ask the UE at any one time transmit only on one uh, carrier. Although you have two carriers, you have to multiplex them smartly so that you don't uh, transmit on both the carriers at the same time. So this is again kind of done through the network. So the network has to schedule it in such a way that UE doesn't end up transmitting on both the carriers at the same time. Again, it's a challenge. It's a, now it's a challenge for the node also to the network to schedule it properly. So these are some of the challenges. And mind you, these challenges are there just for two TX. We are not even talking about a third transmit chain. In fact, most UEs will have only two transmit chains inside. 
maybe there are some ex exceptional ues i am not aware of which have three transmit chains but most ues will have only two transmit chains but even with two transmit chains the challenges are considerable any other questions i think we are running out of time yeah so uh, so this uh, the uh, the possibility of intermodal uh, this interference uh, will it be more specific to the fdd bands or will it be also similar i mean will it be uh, applicable to 3d tdd bands also i don't know the answer for that i have not come across any statement comparing these two but i believe there is no reason why it should be specific to ftd or tdd i think both will be affected yeah. it depends on the combination really okay thanks for uh, joining the call and thanks for many interesting questions it made the whole session very interactive thank you I hope, thank you so much i hope you understood this uh, i understood a little bit about uh, carrier aggregation and dual connectivity and to know more of course you can go to our website devopedia.org where these two articles are published uh, so there is one article on dual connectivity and one article on carrier aggregation the carrier aggregation is uh, sparse so i hope to complete it by tomorrow dual connectivity is uh, has lot more details so you can go and read through it so you will get a deeper understanding of what it is the other uh, useful article may be this one 5g deployment options so we already talked about the deployment options uh, so this article give, goes into greater depth so i uh, we talked about option 3 but there are other sub options option 3a option 3x which are also important for migration from 4g to 5g networks so you can read about these options and uh, yeah so a lot more details are there in this particular article on 5g uh, deployment options so yeah and uh, you know in the future we hope to write many more articles for example dynamic spectrum sharing 4g 5g networking because this is a big subject it is not just about dual connectivity or non standalone mode 4g 5g internet working is a bigger topic 5g transport network so there are many more topics which we want to write about so if any of you are interested in contributing uh, yeah just get in touch with me through linkedin or whatever so you should be having good keen keen interest in research and writing so then we can produce more of these articles and share it with the community so that is what we are trying to do at uh, at uh, devopedia and this particular url gives all the articles related to 5g so we have more than 30 close to 40 articles and uh, yeah every week or every month we are publishing more articles on 5g so that's it thanks for joining us uh, Have a good weekend.